grace. That word has been used and abused, has become a word to mean whatever the person wants it to mean. This series of messages is going to be challenging to every one of us. You will see how the grace of our Lord overrules even the most blatant failure. You can learn afresh how to cherish the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ instead of wallowing in your pain and guilt. Up next on Leading the Way. Story time. A wealthy family in England have invited some friends to come and spend the summer vacation in their Scotland country estate. When the children went to that local lake and they were swimming, one boy went into the deep end and he began to drown. Fortunately, there's the gardener. The gardener was nearby and he heard the call, help, help, help. He immediately ran into the lake and jumped into the water to rescue that helpless victim. That helpless victim was young Winston Churchill. His parents were so deeply grateful to the gardener, they were so overwhelmed with gratitude, and they they wanted to do something for him. And so they asked him, you know, what can we do? Anything we can do for you, we, we, we feel. And the gardener hesitated for a moment, and then he said, well, I have a young boy who has a dream that one day he'll go to college and maybe become a doctor. And they immediately, without hesitation, the Churchills said, will pay his way. So fast forward years later. So Winston Churchill now is a prime minister of England. And he was struck by a severe case of pneumonia. In fact, there was some recently there was a movie where this is documented. The king, father of Queen Elizabeth, really loved Winston Churchill and cared for him deeply, and he was concerned about his health. So he issued a call to find the the top specialist in the country, somebody who can really come and and help the ailing prime minister. And so they found this doctor, and he was no other than Sir Alexander Fleming, the man who, among other things, discovered penicillin and sulfur and all that. Dr. Alexander Fleming was no other than the son of the gardener who saved Winston Churchill's life many years earlier. It may be a coincidence. It may be another situation like this that you probably know about, but it illustrates the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. But before I continue, we'll get into this episode of Jacob's life, we have begun the series of messages from the life of Jacob when titled that fear deceives, but grace frees or sets us free. But before I get there, I want to tell you that in the New Testament, because there is a distinction, but in the New Testament, When you come to Jesus Christ, surrendering to Him and receiving Him as the only Savior and the Lord of your life, all of our sins, past, present, and future sins, all of sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Yet often, the scars of sins or the consequences of what we have sown in the past Those scars sometimes not only stay for a long time, sometimes for life. And here's where many Christians are confused, and I found this through my years in ministry, and I wanted really, I'm going to harp on this one, (laughs) because I've seen that confusion in the mind of many. They confuse the scars or the consequences of the reaping of what they've sown for lack of God's forgiveness. They confuse what they're reaping as a result of what they've sown with the lack of love on God's part. And they say, if God really forgave me, why are these scars that I'm carrying? 
It would be like a, a little boy whose parents have said to him on numerous occasions, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove, but then he decides to experiment and do it for himself. And he gets burnt. And here they are sitting in the ambulance taking their son to the hospital, and the boy was saying, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, forgive me. What will they do? Of course they forgive him, right? Can they remove the scars? Most likely not. I'm saying all of this to beg you. I am begging you, whether you're watching or you're here in this sanctuary, not to confuse the scars or the natural reaping of what have been sown with God's love and forgiveness and the grace of God that is available to His children. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to do something. And it's this. Every time you see the scars in your life, the scars of reaping whatever it's been sown, that you remind yourself of the love of God and of the forgiveness of God and of the overruling grace of God. Amen? Amen. In this episode of Jacob's life, we see <laughs> the deceiver is deceived. Isn't that amazing? Probably a more romantic preacher than me, although I think I'm romantic enough, huh? don't you think? I mean... <laughs> But, but I think a more romantic preacher would just focus on the love story between Rachel and Jacob. Well, I'm going to get to it, but I'm not going to focus on it. <laughs> and it is a truly a great love story. It's an epic love story. It's an amazing story. You see, today Jacob reaches his destination. We saw in the map how he, two days walking, and he got from Beersheba, which is modern-day Gaza, and he got to Bethel, and there he saw a vision of God, put on altar, and then he continued in his walk to Haran. It's modern day south of Iraq. After loneliness and pain and suffering uh, in the desert all alone at night and in the daytime, he reaches his uncle's house. After receiving a great vision from the Lord, a great revelation from the Lord that he and his seed will be through whom the Messiah will come. He sees a vision of the pre-incarnate Jesus on top of the stairs going up to heaven at Bethel. Now he is home away from home. Here he is in his mom's hometown, Rebecca's hometown. And he comes face to face with sowing and reaping. Let me tell you again, as I distinguish between the grace of God that overrules and the consequences of sin. Now, as again, I'm harping on it because I've seen it in my personal experience of talking to people and ministering to people. There's some believers whom I have been Christians for years, and yet they keep on living under false guilt. And false guilt is very different from conviction. When we get convicted of sin, we repent of our sins and turn to the Lord and receive His forgiveness on a daily basis. But false guilt is different. And those who fill their mind with false guilt, they, they cease to grow in the Lord and they cease to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. Why? Because they cannot distinguish between the grace of God and the consequences of their sins because they cannot distinguish between God's forgiveness and the lingering scars, because they do not understand or do not want to understand that at the cross, all of our sins are forgiven regardless of the scars. So when Jacob arrives at Haran and he sees his cousin Rachel, man, he is smitten. You see, for Jacob, Rachel, love at first sight. My goodness, I mean, poor old Jacob. He fell in love hard. I mean, he, he, he fell head over heels for Rachel. He even tried to show a superman strength. Normally, that stone on top of that well, it takes several men to move it, but he was going to show off, so he went in there and pulled it all by himself. Probably busted something. 
Jacob, his love for Rachel made him irrational, (laughs) but also made him irrationally patient, irrationally patient. I'm going to explain this to you. He would do whatever it takes, including 14 years of hard labor. Now, don't miss the next verse. It's very important. This, my beloved friends, is what you call a Middle East bargaining or negotiating at its best. Jacob wanted the girl so badly that he was willing to go to any lengths to marry her. Oh, but listen, (laughs) tricky-dicky Uncle Laban father of the girl, you see, he sensed it. He, he saw it in his eyes. I mean, he, he, he can feel it. He can feel that incredible love, and he milked it for all he can get out of it. It was customary back then for a guest, house guest, can come and stay three or four days maximum uh, as a guest and then move on. In fact, that's how it was in medieval England. You know, somebody stayed past four days as a house guest, they serve him a cold shoulder. And that's where we get the cold shoulder, give him the cold shoulder from. When you get served the cold shoulder, you better pack your bag and keep going. And so he was willing to work his heart out. But manipulative uncle, verse 15, he said, well, just because you're my nephew, it doesn't mean that I, I shouldn't pay you something for your labor. Watch out. This is a negotiator. This is a bargaining in the bazaar. This is, my friends, what is really, really, we can call the art of the deal. (laughs) This is really the art of the deal. Look at what happens next. And please, please, please feel free to compare this with the instant gratification culture in which we live. Jacob said, I would be willing to work for seven years to have the privilege of marrying your younger daughter, Rachel. He was probably thinking that because even the custom of the day, this is excessive, normally a year or two, and he was hoping probably that his uncle would say, oh, this is too much. One or two years will be enough. But... His tricky, dicky uncle Laban jumped all over this offer. Look at verse 20. Here's what you can underline in your Bible. The seven years seemed like only a few days to him because he was in love with Rachel. Listen to me. Listen to me. There is nothing like making your wife feel valued and treasured and appreciated. Now, husbands, again, if I can only speak to you as a husband and a man. Now, wives, you can eavesdrop, but no elbows flying, please. (laughs) Guys, I want to tell you something. If you take time, and at least once a day, at least once a day, and tell your wife how important she is to you, how valued she is by you, how blessed you are to have her, how thankful you are to the Lord for her, and how much she means to you once a day, I promise you, I make you a promise, in one month, even if you're married to the iron lady herself, she'll melt. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's gone from the ladies. (laughs) Jacob adored Rachel. And his tricky uncle knew it. Oh, but the plot thickens. See, Rachel had an older sister, poor Aaliyah. And so on the night of the wedding, when it's bad luck to see the bride, boy, they played that one. (laughs) In the darkness of the tent at night, old tricky uncle Laban gives him Leah instead of Rachel. After seven years of hard labor, after seven years of patiently waiting, after seven years of sweat and blood, 
in the dark night, Laban switches and he gives him Leah. Obviously, Leah must have dressed like Rachel. She must have smelled like Rachel, must have the same built as Rachel. And that is why when Jacob gets up in the morning and discovers what happened, he freaks out. I mean, basically, you see it even in his words. I mean, he freaks out. This is to put it mildly. He goes to his father-in-law slash uncle, and he had it out with him. (laughs) Verse 25, why have you deceived me? Wow, (laughs) the chickens come home to roost. (laughs) The deceiver is now being deceived. And the tragedy is, this is not the last time Jacob becomes a victim of deception. We'll see it as we go on for the, in the next few messages. Forgiveness, yes. Grace, yes. Scars, they linger on. Consequences, yes. Jacob deceived his nearly blind father, Isaac. Now he is deceived by his uncle by marrying a nearly blind woman whom he did not love. Although Jacob managed to marry the love of his life seven days later, but he had to work seven more years. There are a whole bunch of ironies here, and I do not believe the Scripture, the Holy Spirit who authored the Scripture, would waste words. I believe with all my heart the Holy Spirit wants us to see these ironies. Irony number one, Esau was supposed to serve Jacob, for that was the vision that God gave their mother, that the older shall serve the younger. Here, Jacob serves his uncle. Irony number two, by getting Leah first, then Rachel, Jacob felt what Esau must have felt when he lost his birthright. Irony number three, Jacob was deceived by Rachel's father just as he deceived his father. Beloved, God is not mocked. What man sows he also shall reap. He said, God has forgiven me. Absolutely. God has redeemed me. Yes, without a shadow of doubt. God has even forgotten my sins. Yes, he did. The scars or the consequences can live on. But don't let that keep you back. Don't let that hold you back. Because these things are set in motion. There's three things I want to share with you today, and no, don't, don't panic. This is not the three-point sermon that I've just begun, because I was like, oh, he just began with the three-point. These are fast points, okay? And I hope you'll write them down. I want you to remember them. They're very simple, but they hopefully help you as you walk with the Lord. Very quick three points. Whatever we sow, we reap in kind. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what a man sows. So let me ask you a question. If you plant wheat, what do you get? Cotton? You get wheat, right? If you plant corn, you don't get rice. (laughs) You get corn. So when you plant love, you reap love. When you plant friendship, you reap friendship. When you plant peace, you reap peace and become a peacemaker. Second point is this. The same proportion with which you sow is the same proportion that you reap. Now, don't give me credit. I'm not that smart. I did not make it up. Jesus is the one who said that. Okay? So before you get mad at me. I'm I'm only telling you what's in the Scripture. Because you cannot sow sparingly and you expect a bumper crop. Here's what Jesus said. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. 
for by the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That's Jesus' words. In fact, the Apostle Paul affirms this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, whoever sows generously will reap generously. The third point that I want to share with you this morning is this. No matter how long it takes, no matter how long is the delay, no matter how many crop failures you may get along the way, if you keep on sowing consistently in due season, you will get a harvest. So let me ask you, have you prayed for something for so long and you haven't received yet an answer? Keep on planting. Keep on praying. Keep on sowing. Keep on interceding. In due season. In due season. Say that with me. In due season. Have you been faithful to the Lord and faithfully giving of yourself, but you have not seen the abundant harvest yet? Don't give up. Don't you dare give up. Keep on planting. Keep on praying because the harvest is coming. It's a matter of time. Just as in sowing and reaping, in Jacob's case, it worked in the negative. In the Churchill family's case, it worked for the positive. Beloved, listen to me. Sowing and reaping can go either way. It's neutral. It goes both ways. Well, someone here might say, well, you know, I have some scars, and they're keeping me from sowing good seeds. Let me tell you this. The grace of God will overrule. The grace of God will overrule. The very fact that God has overruled in Jacob's case will overrule in your case. Don't let the scars keep you from reaching for the stars. This is not a cliche. It is an absolute truth. Claim the overruling power of the grace of God. Don't ever forget that the overruling grace of God can write His straight purpose with a crooked pencil, that His grace can take a twisted instrument and use it powerfully. God's grace is more powerful than all of your past scars. God's grace can polish the roughest of diamond. God's grace can call the unworthy. God's grace can love the unlovable. God's grace uses the unusable. God's grace can make the dullest of gold to shine. God's grace is more than amazing. 